In this first video of Hobby Robby you will see me having a disastrous paint job, having a disaster with peeling off tape, no, no. and having another disaster no. Look at this. with my decals. Disaster after disaster. But I still will be trying to build a scale model Formula One car. You pass yourself a plastic kid on a scale model car. You don't know what to do with it, but who will help you for Hi, then, you scale model kid lovers. Welcome in my super tiny shed. I'm Hobby Robbie. You might have seen it on my new apron, this print. And this is my very first scale model vlog. And honestly, I thought it wouldn't be as hard as it has become. <laughs> oh my, this is a journey full of obstacles and, well, disasters. And I've only just started. So what am I going to build? That is a super old kit from Tamiya. It's the Lotus Ford 107. It's a Tamiya kit. I bought it secondhand on the interwebs. And it's a 1 in 20 scale. It's got this, well, amazing livery. Well, guys, I'm very curious what's inside the box. Hobby, hobby! But first, let's have a look at the box itself. On the top there is this beautiful box art, which is actually a painting. Yes, Tamiya has painters among their employees. The green and yellow livery is a reminder of the Lotus Formula 1 cars from the 50s and 60s. They were colored in British racing green and had a yellow stripe on the nose. What is remarkable about this car is its staggering amount of Japanese sponsors, about 8 in total. It has advertisements of Hitachi. Komatsu, Shonogi, Nichibutsu, Yellowhead, and last but not least, Tamiya. Say what? Did Tamiya actually sponsor a Formula 1 team? Yes, they did. They sponsored Lotus F1 team from 1991 to 1993. To this day, Tamiya actually owns a Lotus 102B which they exhibit at their own museum in Shizuoka, Japan. And if you would like to know more of this car, please look at this video of my visit to Tamiya and the museum. Oh, that looks nice! In the box you will find a plastic bag with rubber tires that look pretty good after 30 years. There is one big bag which contains the soft yellow body parts, such a nice color, and technical parts. Then there is a bag with the floor, wings and rims. The last bag is a bit special. It contains the suspension parts which are really thin and can break easily. Tamiya has made this proof of a special type of plastic called ABS resin, which is tougher than the normal plastic. The final parts are the manual and two big decal sheets with the story. The decal sheets are the parts that really suffered from age. Some of them have wrinkled and are beyond repair. Some of them have small creases and might be used later. And some look pretty much okay. Oh, and one decal was stolen from this sheet. <laughs> That's what you get with second-hand model kits. The second sheet is a whole lot worse, as you can see. The white decals are clearly very much dead. And there are strange decolorations on the sheet. It looks like someone extinguished his fag on it. The manual is as we know it of Tamiya. On the front is a brief history of the car. Inside are very clear drawings with precise callouts for paints and decals. Formula 1 scale model kits are rather complex, so following the steps is a wise thing to do. Although the manual is very good, there is a fault. Accidentally, the callouts for two decals have been mixed up. Tamiya added this erratum to set it straight. And to be honest, I am not going to use these specific decals anyway. Hobby, Hobby! I like to make my models as accurate as possible. 
Not very much on this car is found on the web, so I bought this Japanese magazine called GP Car Story Volume 32. So now I know what the rear wing end plate looks like. The adjustment holes in the rear wing are neatly molded in the plastic by Tamiya. But there are no holes, so I decided to drill those out. For drilling I used a 0.5mm drill, made by Proxon, with a thick shaft. Having a thick shaft on the drill makes it easier to mount the drill in the pin vise. The pin vise is very basic, but does the job and is made by ProEdge. When you drill through thin plastic, small burrs appear on the other side, so I cut those off with a sharp knife. There are also slots in the wing end plate, so after drilling I cut those out with my knife and send those with multiple tools like needle files and even the pin vise. After cleaning I discovered that my drill bit milled a horizontal plane of the wing. I will repair that later. Using a white background shows the holes and slots I have made. I think it looks pretty cool. Of course I did do more parts than just the rear wing. The front wing gets a special treatment too. To drill out the adjustment holes in the front wing end plate, as this part is called, I used the Tamiya fine pivot drill bit of 0.3mm. This drill cost me more than 6 euros mind you, but it is much better than those cheap drill bits that break all the time. These can cause you having pieces of drill bits stuck in the plastic and that is very hard to get out. But after some serious drilling on a 5 by one5 mil square, I finally got 22 holes! And I had to do it a second time! I already told you I work in a very tiny shed, which means I have to build up my spray booth every time I want to use it. It takes me about 20 minutes to complete. The spray booth I use is portable. It does not have any brand name, but it does have a type name, which is HS420DCL. I bought it on eBay and I'll leave a link in the description below the video. I use a large cup on my spray gun to prevent spilling. The spray gun is a Harder and Steenbeck Evolution 2-in-1 with a 0.3mm needle. For priming I use Tamiya Liquid Surface Primer, the grey variant, and Tamiya Lacquered Thinner Retarder Type. Before mixing I shake the primer bottle thoroughly. I use 5ml pipettes to get the paint in the spray gun. For spraying you first need to thin the primer. I do this in a 50-50 ratio. I always use a dummy model, a Jaguar Mark II in this case, to check if I diluted the paint in a proper way. The rear wing is a nasty piece to get a grip on, so I stuck a piece of masking tape on the bottom to make it easier to handle. I first try to lay down a thin coat of primer. Since I am not used to filming myself spraying, I slowly creep out of the shot. Sorry guys. Tamiya primer is really easy to apply and very forgiving. You cannot go wrong with it. After letting the primed wing dry for about 24 hours, I sand it in order to make the surface smooth. Here I use a Tamiya sanding sponge with 1000 grit. I like those sponges a lot. They conform to curved surfaces and they also go a long way. I used Zero Paints Jet Black to match the carbon look. This is a very nice off black color. I use a trumpeter paint mixer which I find a safer way to mix instead of shaking the bottle. Although the rear wing will be mostly covered in decals, you'll still need to paint it for the edges. Again I use my dummy jack to test the paint. Zero paints are pre-thinned, actually it is very thin. It will always spray. Because zero paints contain a lot of thinner, it can easily craze. I found out the hard way multiple times during this build, yeah. I start spraying with the inner parts of the wing. I try to build up the paint layers easy. Some horizontal planes of the wings are masked since they will be white. Although I thought I was careful, the paint did think I was not. It crazed. 
So I sanded it again with a Tamiya 3000 grit sponge and applied a new layer. Zero paints should not be painted in wet coats unless you use clear coats. They are much less forgiving than for instance Tamiya lacquer paints. You can see the paint is still a bit crazed. Luckily all will be hidden behind decals, but the edges. But it is a good lesson learned. Or is it? After having the end plate primed, I painted it with Zero Paints Jet Black. I use a barbecue stick, which I stuck in a hole, as a holder. The tip of the stick is dipped in Mr. Masking Soul R by Mr. Hobby. This is a masking fluid which is kinda rubbery. That gives some grip on the end of the barbecue stick, so the end plate won't slide off. For spraying the front wing I used GSI Creo sticks which bites into a piece of masking tape that is stuck on the wing. You can clearly see this isn't the best way as the wing moves by the air pressure of the spray gun. I will solve this in the second run. Unfortunately a blob of paint blew on the wing which is caused by accumulated paint in the spray nozzle. I am lucky that this part will be totally covered in carbon decals. But I wasn't too happy with it, so I sanded this part down too. To have a better grip on the wing, I drilled two holes into the side of it. In the holes I stuck a piece of metal wire. That will make a sturdier grip when I clip a GSI Creole stick onto that. Now I build up my layers of paint more careful. Just thin coats of paint and I let it dry for about 5 minutes after each coat. After the third coat, I was happy. Robbie, Robbie. When you are building a sports car upward from the 1980s, almost all callouts for semi-gloss black or X18 when you're making a Tamiya kit are carbon fiber. This is a big sheet from which you have to cut your own decals. My mother asked me, why do you do this? Why don't you paint it black? So, in order to explain to my mom and maybe some of you, I made this quick video about carbon fiber. What is carbon fiber? Well, it's a composite material that is very light and very strong. And behind me, you probably have seen it already, are two wings from Formula One cars, which are made of carbon fiber. And when you look at them, you think, well, they are painted. They could be aluminum for my part because you can't see from the outside that it's carbon fiber. But you can see it from the rear. And I'm going to show you that. So this wing is from a uh, Footwork Arrows FA12 from 1990. And I am going to turn it around. <laughs> if that works, yes. It's got a hinge. Uh, be careful, yes. So here you can see the back. And maybe you think, okay Rob, that's black. So why can I, can't I paint it with Tamiya X18? Well, you can of course, but if you look closely, you can see lines here. And that's a uh, characteristic for carbon fiber. These weaved lines, that's the composite material. And I like to replicate that in my models, but it's a huge job to make all these decals because not for every car those decals are made by aftermarket specialists. Making carbon fiber decals is hell. For replicating carbon fiber, I use a decal sheet by Tamiya from the Detail Up Part Series. To make a perfect replica of the part you want to wrap in carbon, you stick a piece of masking tape on that part. With a fine liner or a sharpie, you draw the contours of the part on the tape. It's a smart thing to do to note the direction of the carbon weave on the tape. Also give the piece of the tape a name tag, because you will be making a lot of decals and don't want to get confused. After removing the tape from the part, you detack it by sticking it on your body. You can choose the body parts yourself. 
Detacking is necessary because you'll need to stick the tape onto the decal sheet. I tape my metal ruler to my cutting mat and align the decal sheet with it. The pattern of the carbon weave runs diagonal on the decal sheet, but I need straight lines for this particular part. Then I use a fresh knife blade and cut the decal out precisely. Then we have to split hairs to remove the tape from the decal. This is a fiddly job, but I got it done. Just about a hundred more decals to go. Oh, and writing the parts name on the backing paper of the decal sheet is smart too. In case your decal fails, and we are about to see such an event, you can use the backing paper to trace a new one. Here I am making a carbon decal for the front wing end plate when things went a bit wrong. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Oh no. Oh yeah, I ripped the carbon decal apart. That's because I probably did not detect the tape enough. So I made a new one. In the end plate is a slot, you know, the one with the 22 holes? To cut out that part, because I don't want to block the holes with my decal, I use a very special tool. It's called a stone setting beading tool. That's right. And it's used in jewelry production and ideal to punch holes. The tool contains a handle with a vise in which you can put different size stems. My tool does not have a brand name or type. Just google on stone setting beading tool to find yours. You need to apply a bit of force to punch out the holes in the decal. After that I connect both holes by cutting it out by hand, turning it into a slot. After removing the tape, you have a pretty nice decal. For applying decals I use micro scale products. Micro set the glue and micro sole the softener. I saw this decal squeegee tool from HIQ parts being used by Chris from Ziggy's desk. The squeegee is very handy for burnishing down the decals. It has a slanted sponge and a straight one. I start with the front wing end plate. First. I apply micro sole. This medium works as a glue and gives the decal more adherence. After leaving the decal in lukewarm water for about half a minute, I slide it onto the part. Then I apply decal sole on the decal. This makes the surface of the decal softer to make it conform to the part better. This process takes time and you can apply it multiple times, but be careful. Then I start rolling and burnishing the decal down with the squeegee. After this process is completed, the carbon decal has really conformed to the part and looks like it has been painted on. Then I finish the other side of the wing end plate. This is how many decals the vortex generators need, quite a bunch. So I did it all again, applying sol, using a hairdryer to make it conform better, sol again, burnishing, sol, burnishing, hairdryer, yeah. And another carbon piece done. And another one. And some carbon decals on the rear wing were applied. So after the carbon decals for the front and rear wing decals are applied, it's the sponsor decals turn. And you remember how bad most of those were. So I decided to design new ones. All of them. I designed the logos in Adobe Illustrator, mostly by tracing them by hand. The image trace tool in Illustrator did not work so well since I have a very antique version. <laughs> The whole process cost me about 34 hours. It was a gruesome job as many sponsor logos were unavailable on the web. Here you see me use a photo of a broken nose cone of the real Lotus 107 as a reference, in order to make the shape of the race number correct. This is how the Tamiya decals look. Not too good. And once you're getting the hang of it, you can't stop designing. 
I even did a total remake of the scrutineering badge that will be about 3 by 5 millimeters when printed. When done, I had one sheet with the colored logos and one with the white logos, here seen in black. These are printed on a HP printer using a ghost white toner cartridge to print white. I wanted to try the yellow decals since there are a lot of them. After cutting out the decal, I came to a shocking conclusion. The yellow color does not cover the black at all. This made almost all of my design work useless. My laser printer cannot print colors that cover fully when you use mixed colors. They are printed dotted and leave space for another color to shine through. So I decided to buy a decal set from Museum Collection, the only replacement set that is around for this kit. It contains one big decal sheet, which has ray stripes, and an additional set that has ray stripes too. This seems to be a correction since the first stripes are way too yellow and the dark green was left out too. It also has a replacement for the stripes on Hakkinen's helmet. In the set a drawing of the car and helmets of the drivers is included, but it does not contain callouts for the exact placements of the decals, so you'll need the Tamiya manual for that. Unfortunately, the museum collection decals proved to be thick and brittle. This one came up broken after its soaking bath of 30 seconds. A bit of a false start. At the second decal, it happened again. How is this possible? Yeah. Like breaking apart. Quite frustrating since I paid 50 euros for this set. I contacted Museum Collection over this problem, but got no reply. It just breaks apart without any reason, apparently. Eventually, I got it done. After that, both wing end plates got their decals too. And did you know that Nichibuchu was a Japanese computer game company? After all decals were applied on the parts of the front wing, I started to cover them with a clear finish. A matte clear finish, so to say, because carbon fiber itself is not shiny. I used Tamiya LP23 flat clear for this job. Although I really liked the finish, I had a small air bubble on the edge of the main plane. So I cut a piece of tailor-made tape to protect the wing's finish during the scraping and sanding. Then I painted it with a bit of Tamiya LP56 dark iron. And then finally all the parts of the front wing were ready for assembly. But that would prove to be a rather horrendous undertaking. Painting your decals? Yes! I decided to use a decal from the original, more than 30 year old Tamiya sheet since I thought it looked better. And you know it's better to be safe than sorry, so I used micro scale liquid decal film as a protective layer. This has a drying time of approximately 15 minutes. So, in the meantime, I could make a mask in order to get those holes of the rear wing end plate in the decal. Then I stuck the heavily detect tape onto the dry decal. With my stone setting beading tool, what a word, <laughs> I punched the holes through the masking tape into the decal. I cut out the slots between the holes, removed the tape carefully and cut the decal out of the paper. After some clipping of the curved edges, the decal is good to go. The bottom part of the wing end plate is plain carbon fiber and not Tamiya X18, guys. <laughs> so I made a decal for that. Then the application of sponsor decals and the race number. This Tamiya decal broke in multiple parts, but I got them all lined up. All in all, it took seven separate decals to finish only one wing end plate. But it was worth the effort. I think it looks quite the part. After I masked off the wing end plates, it was time to spray paint the horizontal planes of the rear wing white. I used the Mia liquid surface primer for this, since it has very good covering capabilities. A whole lot of Hitachi decals were applied. 
These are from the museum collection decal sheet. That still breaks sometimes. I left the decals to dry for a day and then sprayed them with a gloss varnish using Tamiya LP9. After leaving this to dry for a day too, I peeled the masking tape off, but this would have a very nasty surprise. No, no! Is there something like psychological help for scale modelers? Uh, no. At least I master proper sighing. Oh my god, all this work. Yeah, it's a shame. This is a nightmare, a nightmare. Thank you for leaving your comments of consolation below, dear fellow modelers. After I accidentally ripped off the decals and paint on the top of the wing end plate, I started on the bottom, very carefully. Here's the damage. A piece of decal and paint stuck on the tape and a torn wing end plate. Then I had the courage to remove it on the other side too and luckily that went well. Took some serious surgical precision and a whole lot of time to remove the stuck slice of decals and paint. Removing millimeter by millimeter using the master tool tweezers which have a very sharp end. I finally managed to remove it in one piece. To get this piece back on the wing again I used Micro Crystal Clear from Microscale. This is a glue that should be capable to do the job and it dries transparent. For applying the glue I used one of the Mr. Glue applicator sticks by Mr. Hobby. And after some touching up with paint and a bit of drilling the rear wing was done. I used Zero Paints Castro Green for the nose cone but not to my liking. As I told you Zero Paint can be very hot. That is, it contains a lot of thinner. I had a lot of trouble with applying it. At first, it was my fault. I sprayed it on too wet, causing the paint to craze. But I sanded it down and sprayed it again. This time I took a lot of precaution. Sprayed it very lightly and waited about 10 minutes between coats. But after having applied about 4 coats, it crazed again. I was frustrated even had a blob of paint in my spray work. I cursed heavily, sorry about that, and decided I didn't want to use it anymore. So I mixed my own Castrol Green, using Tamiya LP6 and LP8. I do not have an exact mixing ratio for you since I started with too much yellow and had to add quite a bit of blue to get it green. I always spray my paints on primed spoons to have a color reference. I'm very satisfied with my mix. And Tamiya lacquer paints spray much easier than zero paints to be honest. All parts for the front wing were now finished, apart from the decals on the nose cone. It was time to glue them together. I removed the paint from the areas where glue should sit. In order to do this properly, I used BSI Instacure Plus Superglue. Surprisingly, the front wing did not attach to the wing end plate that well. It leaves a nasty gap. A shame I did not see that before. You should always test fit, I know. So I filed the upper flap down a bit. Finally, I decided to remove this flap from the main plane too, since that would give me more room to mount it precisely. First I test fitted the parts and then I applied super glue using Mr. Glue applicators. I used Zip Kicker from Zap, I did not make this up, to have the glue bond instantly. But then another disaster struck. The wing end plate broke off when I tried to apply the glue on the other side. Who is this mogelijk? This really sank my boat. No, look at this. It's disaster after disaster. Damn.
so that was my first vlog and it was not an easy one. <laughs> oh my god i mean you saw the disasters and all the failures um i hope you learned something from it i certainly did and man this cost me ages to complete this vlog it's way too long i mean you saw snow in the first shot of this vlog and now it is mid-summer wearing a t-shirt so um and i only complete the rear wing so the cliffhanger for the next vlog is the front wing <laughs> so i wonder how do you guys do this i mean um do you complete a model kit in 14 days or do you four weeks or do you take a year to complete one i mean i'm quite slow at this okay now this i really want to thank uh, a group of people who really helped me with this vlog at first uh, hank and jacob feestra um, they helped me with the hobby robbie song and you can hear it you heard it up front and you can hear it after this in full length with a small video clip uh, hank and jacob thank you so much i also like to thank uh, frank boxman because he made the animated logo and all the bouncing around of the helmet hobby robbies so uh, frank thanks a lot mate perfect job there are more people who help me your names are in the credits thank you also and uh thank you for watching you you people and um like subscribe and comment let me know what you think of my first vlog and I also have a Patreon page. You can become my patron and support me because I will, well, I'm trying to make a living out of this. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so you can support me. Uh, the link is uh, below the video. Um, and now watch for the full length version of the Hobby Robbie song. And don't be sobby, build a car model kit and watch Hobby Robbie! You pass yourself a plastic kit on a scale model car. You don't know what to do with it, but who will help you for Hobby Robbie? Manual looks like a trap. I glued my finger. Who else you're glued? Happy Robbie!